Hello, brothers and sisters in Christ. Pastor John here. Um, give you a couple of heads up about today. The main thing that I'd like to do is, in preparation for worship on Sunday, I, I'd like to most of this video to just be a uh, reading of scripture. I'm going to use two scriptures. One, they're, they're kind of longer passages, and so I thought it would be helpful to break it up. The first is from John 3. This was the lectionary reading maybe two or three weeks ago. And then from John 4, the woman at the well. And so I'm going to, that's basically what we're going to be doing. I'm going to read this from Eugene Peterson's translation, The Message. But I also want to let you know a couple of things. One is that even though we're not able to gather here, the expenses of our ministry and just the running of our church continue on. We still have insurance, we still have a mortgage, we still have payroll, still have light and heat to pay for. So uh, most of our um, giving comes in on Sunday mornings, but we're not gathering here on Sunday mornings. So really encourage you, whether you can mail uh, electronically, you can drop it off at the church to please continue your, your giving and your tithing. And I understand that the way things are right now, the financially may be hitting some of us. And, and that's okay. I understand that too. But if you're able, I really just want to encourage you not to forget about our giving because it's really important to what we do here. Also want to let you know we're working on figuring out a way, uh, a more sophisticated way than me and my uh, cell phone, of doing our worship in this space. That's the reason why I'm here today kind of ground us, remind us of the sanctuary, and we are living in it as God's presence. But, you know, there's something about place and space that uh, kind of reminds us. And so I'm going to try to do more of this in here. We're going to try to record some of our music that we would normally do here, as well as linking to others, and maybe include a little bit of liturgy and a children's message as well. So just wanted to give you a heads up. We're working on that. We haven't quite figured it out yet. We have some technological limitations, but we're trying to move beyond that. So here, the word of the Lord from the Gospel of John, chapter 3. There was a man of the Pharisee sect named Nicodemus, a prominent leader among the Jews. Late one night, he visited Jesus. He said, Rabbi, we all know you're a teacher straight from God. No one could do all the God-pointing, God-revealing acts you do if God weren't in on it. Jesus said, you're absolutely right, Nicodemus. Take it from me. Unless a person is born from above, it's not possible to see what I'm pointing to, to God's kingdom. How can anyone, said Nicodemus, be born who's already been born and grown up? You can't re-enter your mother's womb and be born again. What are you saying with this born from above talk? Jesus said, you're not listening. Let me say it again. Unless a person submits to the original creation, the wind hovering over the water creation, an allusion to Genesis 1, the invisible moving the visible, a baptism into new life, it's not possible to enter God's kingdom. When you look at a baby, it's just that, a body you can look at and touch. But the person who takes shape within is formed by something you can't see and touch, spirit. And it becomes a living spirit. So don't be so surprised when I tell you that you have to be born from above, out of this world, so to speak. You know well enough how the wind blows this way and that. You hear it rustling through the trees, but you have no one, um, but you have no idea where it comes from or where it is headed next. That's the way it is with everyone who is born from above, by the wind of God, the Spirit of God. Nicodemus asked, what do you mean by this? How does this happen? Jesus said, you're a respected teacher of Israel and you don't know the basics? Listen carefully. I'm speaking sober truth to you and I speak only what I know by experience. I give witness only to what I have seen with my own eyes. No hearsay, nothing secondhand here. Yet instead of facing the evidence and accepting it, you procrastinate with questions. If I tell you things that are plain as the hand before your face and you don't believe me, what use is there in telling you things you can't see, the things of God? No one has ever gone into the presence of God except the one who came down from the presence, that is the Son of Man. In the same way that Moses lifted the serpent up in the desert so people could have something to see and then believe, it is necessary for the Son of Man to be lifted up, and everyone who looks to him, trusting and expectant, will gain a real life, eternal life. So this is how much God loved the world. He gave his Son, his only, his one Son. And this is why. So that no one need be destroyed. By believing in him, anyone can have a whole and lasting life. 
God didn't go to all the trouble of sending his son merely to point an accusing finger, telling the world how bad it was. He came to help, to put the world to right again. Anyone who trusts in him is acquitted. Anyone who refuses to trust in him has long since been under the death sentence without knowing it. And why? Because of that person's failure to believe in the the one-of-the-kind Son of God when introduced to him. This is the crisis we're in. Godlight streamed into the world, but men and women everywhere rather ran for darkness. They went for the darkness because they weren't really interested in pleasing God. Everyone who makes a practice of doing evil, addicted to denial and illusion, hates God light and won't come near it, fearing a painful exposure. But anyone working and living in truth and reality welcomes God light so the work can be seen for the God work that it is. And now from John chapter 4, verses 1 through 42. Jesus realized that the Pharisees were counting the baptisms that he and John performed, even though it was the disciples and not Jesus who actually did the baptizing. They had posted the score that Jesus was ahead, turning him and John into rivals in the eyes of the people. So, Jesus left the Judean countryside and went back to Galilee. To get there, he had to pass through Samaria. And in the Greek here, it, it's really emphatic. He had to pass, as if there were no other option to him, but he had to. And he came to Sychar, where a Samaritan, a Samaritan village that bordered the field Jacob had given his son Joseph. Jacob's well was still there. Jesus, worn out by the trip, sat down at the well. And at that time, it was noon. A woman, a Samaritan woman, came to draw water. Jesus said, would you give me a drink of water? His disciples had gone to the village to buy food for lunch. The Samaritan woman, taken aback, asked, how come you, a Jew, are asking me, a Samaritan woman, for a drink? For Jews in those days wouldn't be caught dead talking to a Samaritan. Jesus answered, if you knew the generosity, the free gift of God, and if you knew who I am, You'd be asking me for a drink, and I would give you fresh living water. The woman said, Sir, you don't even have a bucket to draw with. This well is deep. How are you going to get this living water? Are you a better man than our ancestor Jacob, who dug this well and drank from it, he and his sons and livestock, and passed it down to us? Jesus said, Everybody who drinks this water will get thirsty again and again. Anyone who takes even one sip of the water that I will give will never thirst, not ever. The water I give will become an artesian spring within you, gushing fountains of endless life. The woman said, Sir, still not getting it, give me this water so I won't ever get thirsty and I won't ever have to come back to this well again. He said, Go call your husband and then come back. Well, I have no husband, she said. That's nicely put, I have no husband, for you've had five husbands and the man you're living with now isn't one of them. You spoke the truth, sure enough. Oh, so you're a prophet. Well then, prophet, tell me this. Our ancestors worshipped God at this mountain, but you Jews insist Jerusalem is the only place to worship, right? Jesus responded, Believe me, woman, the time is coming when you Samaritans will worship the Father neither here nor uh, on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You worship guessing in the dark. We Jews worship in the clear light of day. God's way of salvation is made available through the Jews, but the time is coming, it has in fact come, when what you're called won't matter, where you worship won't matter either. It's you who are, um, I'm sorry, it's who you are and the way you live that count before God. Your worship must engage your spirit in the pursuit of truth. That's the kind of people the Father is out looking for. Those who are simply and honestly themselves before him in their worship. For God is spirit, sheer being itself. Those who worship him must do it out of their very being, their spirits, their true selves. The woman said, I don't know about that, but I do know that the Messiah is coming and when he arrives, we'll get the whole story. I am he said Jesus, which is one of John's kind of cryptic backdoor way of Jesus saying, I am, which is an allusion to Exodus 3, where Moses asks God his name, and God says, 
I am who I am. And so Jesus here is identifying himself. I am he. You don't have to wait any longer or look any further for the Messiah. And just then his disciples came back and they were shocked. They couldn't believe he was talking with that kind of a woman. No one said what they were thinking, but their faces showed it. The woman took the hint and left. In her confusion, she even left her water pot. Back in the village, she told the people, come see a man who knew all about the things I did, who knows me inside and out. Maybe he could be the Messiah. And they went out to see for themselves. Friends, this is the word of God given for the people of God. Thanks be to God.